We have been talking about angels in our last lecture, and though we're coming now to the being who interests us most, namely man, I want to show the relation of angels to man in some further detail than was mentioned in the last lecture. But let me read these propositions first of all. Man, too, was made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26, 5, 3, 3, 10, to just as the angels, but less so. He had a body. Three, strange. The Bible stresses the image of God in man, though it was less than in angels. Strange, though lower than angels, man should be raised above them. Strange, though once fallen and inferior, redeemed men are the lords of their unfallen superiors. Six, strange, Christ died to save prodigal sons whom he yet loved more than these elder brethren, angels who never left home. Seven, strange, prodigal man, the more love for being prodigal, the angelic brethren, less love for being loyal. Eight, strange, 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 one below the angels brought into the Godhead, a member of the divine family, the fourth person in the Trinity, as it were, man. Nine, strange, all creation, all providence, all redemption for the sake of this one creature. But for man, there would be nothing but God. Psalm 8, 10. As if God lived and moved and had his being in man. Man whose only greatness is his humility. He had much about which to be humble. He had nothing about which to be proud. He had nothing and less than nothing except God, his Savior. Let's look at number one. Man, too, was made in the image of God. We all know that, of course. I don't have to read these passages. Just number two, as the angels, but less so because he had a body. We say less so. But I guess you know the angels <laughs> may not have thought so. Certainly, the Mormons don't think so. The Mormons, you know, believe that God has a body. And they argue it from the fact that we who are made in his image have a body. We are made in his image. We have a body, therefore he has a body. It certainly seems like straight line reasoning, and it's no liability, but a superiority in us to have a body if God has one. And instead of it being what I was saying when we were talking about the angels, that they are superior to us because they don't have the drag of a body, they really would be inferior because they have less of the image of God than we do. One time the Mormons were invading our territory in the Pittsburgh area, and the thing about them that's so different, say, from the Jehovah's Witnesses is this. They put themselves forth as more or less traditional, evangelical Christians who really belong as a branch of the Christian church. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, they insist that the church has gone apostate, and they are calling us out of the church and into their fellowship. 
They make no pretenses to be being accepted by us. They don't want to be accepted by us. They want us to leave the church and come to those who are faithful witnesses of Jehovah as they think we no longer are. I'd say the Mormons in their doctrine are further from biblical Christian truth than the Jehovah's Witnesses are, but at the same time they give the impression that they're one with us, which leads me to the episode I was alluding to in this uh, connection. The witnesses, I mean the Mormons were going out, you know, as Mormons do, two by two, door to door, to tell the truth of the Mormon religion as they see it. And a pastor called me from out there because they just about gave altar calls at the doors of his own people. And uh, he sort of knew how to cope with an enemy. But what do you do with people who really have a different theology but act as if they share the same one and are asking your people to be true Protestants by becoming Mormons? So he asked me to come out and help him, and I said, I'd be glad to. So this particular night, we got together, the Mormon leader and about a half a dozen other Mormons, the pastor and about a half a dozen members of his church, and myself to talk over the relationship between what we believed and what they believed. I turned to the leader and I said to him, what topic would you like to discuss that you believe that you know we do not share? I won't name the topic. I'll let you, if you please, to do so. There's only one thing I ask of you. Whatever the topic is we enjoy, uh, uh, consider, that we stick to the subject. No roaming around. And just between you and me, let the others on both sides here be silent. You name the topic, and if it's one that I differ with, I will go on the offense, and you will be on the defense, and any time you want to counterattack, that'll be perfectly in order as long as it's relevant to the subject, and that was agreed. And much to my amazement, though, he chose as the subject the corporeality of God, the Mormon conviction that God had a body. I wasn't surprised in the sense that he believed that, of course, that I knew, but that he would consider that so important that he, when he was dealing with an adversary in the Protestant tradition, he would pick that out as the topic of debate. But he did, and the procedure we followed was this. I'll go through it very quickly. I said to him, you give me your argument for it. And what he did was first mention this very text I've been alluding to. Man was made in God's image. Man has a body. Therefore, God has a body. Now, I talked to that point and showed him how that did not follow. And he, after a few exchanges, agreed that that did not necessarily imply that God had a body. And then he went to another text, another text, another text, another, about five in all, and I examined each one of them with him, cross-examined him about them, and by common consent they were withdrawn. He admitted that not a one of them proved what he was attempting to prove, that God had a body. Really, that's the whole point of my comment here, but I may as well finish this. It has nothing to do with what we're lecturing on here, but some of you may be wondering how it all came out. I was just giving you this as an illustration, not only that Mormons believe God has a body, but how important it is on their theological agenda. But just to finish out the story, after I had, to his satisfaction, mind you, refuted every one of the passages he was appealing to in support of the doctrine, of the corporeality of God, I said to him, well, and he looked at me as if he was in total surprise that I hadn't realized he had won the debate. And I said, uh, well, 
You've withdrawn all your arguments. Now what? And you know what he said to me? Well, don't you admit the cumulative effect of them? <laughs> the cumulative effect. And I said, what is the cumulative effect of five zeros? How do five withdrawals of arguments amount to anything? You know what the final stage was? He looked me in the eye and he said, Dr. Gerstner, don't you believe in prayer? You know what that was supposed to say? He was going to prove from the Bible that God had a body. Every verse he advanced and I analyzed, he withdrew. He was then appealing to the cumulative effect of five zeros. And even after he admitted there wasn't much cumulative effect in five zeros, he was still expecting me to see the truth of what he was teaching and suspecting that the reason I couldn't see that there really was a powerful cumulative effect in five zeros is that I must not have been a man of prayer. If I had been a man of prayer, I would have seen that though no argument was coming forth, his position had been thoroughly demonstrated. I mean, that's beside the point, really, but it's just the fact that what we say is an inferiority of man to angels. They have a body. There are some who think it's a superiority because they think God had a body, but of course God does not have a body. He is a pure spirit, and no one has seen God at any time. Number three, strange that the Bible stresses the image of God in man, though it was less than in the angels. See, we're never told in Scripture, to my knowledge, that the angels were made in the image of God. But we can tell from what's said about them, they have minds, they have understanding, they can communicate messages, so they obviously are like God in being rational beings, and they're like God in being moral beings. They work in His service. They engage in His worship. They have the lineaments of the image of God, even though the Bible doesn't say so in so many words. And since they do not have a body, which is other than the nature of God, they're actually more in the image of God than we are. That's the reason I find it strange that the Bible doesn't say anything about that, but not so strange because they are not the center of the stage. Greater as they are, more powerful, nevertheless, they are not front and center in the biblical story. They are on the sidelines. And may that be the reason that the fact that they actually possess a finer nature than we do natively is not mentioned. But there's stranger things to follow. Number four, though lower than angels, men should be raised above them. I mean, that is surprising, you see. After all, they can do things we can't do. They obviously have a superior understanding. They certainly have superior powers of locomotion. They are definitely superior beings, and they don't have our limitation that we're going to carry through all eternity after the resurrection, you know, and so on. Though lower than angels, men should be raised above them. God creates in a descending order, you see, and certainly we are the next step to the angels, but the angels would be closer to God by nature than we are, but He chooses someone down the line rather than at the top of the line. It's rather strange when you think about it. Number five, strange again, though once fallen and inferior, redeemed men are the lords of their unfallen superiors. See, this gets stranger as the story is told. You're puzzled when unfallen angels are exalted above uh, man in nature, but subordinated to him in function. But when you actually have this business of fallenness coming to man and the unfallen angels are subordinated to him, 
You see, in natural order, the angels are above man. And then when you have the unnatural thing of fallen sinful man, and still these unfallen superior angels are subordinated even to totally depraved sinful human beings, it is a very strange and arresting history indeed. Number six, stranger still, Christ died to save prodigal sons whom he yet loved more than these elder brethren who never left home. You realize that I'm playing there, of course, on the parable of the prodigal son, but you realize what a scope there is for playing on that analogy. In the parable, the elder brother who stayed home was narrow-minded and selfish, and he didn't want his brother to come back and enjoy his father's favor. So even though he had never left home, even though in a sense he was a faithful son, you realize there was a bitter spirit in him. And so you can see in a sense why God would have mercy on the prodigal rather than on the elder brother. But these elder brethren in heaven, they're devoid of sin. They have nothing but virtue. I call them elder brethren only because they stayed home. They didn't move from their place in heaven. They were faithful from the moment they were created, and they will be faithful through all eternity. And yet, Superior as they are by nature, superior as they are by morality, and increasingly superior as the contrast is drawn sharper by the fall of man, nevertheless, Christ never dies for these elder brethren, but he does die to the inferior humans even when they are groveling in the pit of sin. Eight, strange, strange, strange. One below the angels brought into the Godhead. A member of the divine family. The fourth person in the Trinity, as it were. Man, underline as it were, of course. <laughs> no sense in which we're a member of the Trinity. There are three persons in the Trinity. But you see how close we're brought to the Trinity. We are actually a member of the second person of the Trinity. As far as a creature is able to be in the triune Godhead, redeemed men are. I'm playing on the expression of fourth person in the Godhead. Of course, that's absurd and blasphemous and you know not to take me seriously on that, but on the other hand, you know I'm speaking sober truth when I say that when God brought us worms by redemption into the body of his own dear son, we were made acceptable in the son. We're as acceptable as he is by his own acceptability, which has become nine, become his, ours by his great mediation. Number nine, strange, all creation, all providence, all redemption for the sake of this one creature. But for man, there would be nothing but God, Psalm 8. When the angels fell, no pardon, no forgiveness, no redemption, lost forever, gone, bound in everlasting chains of darkness, consigned to hell, everlastingly there, a little bit of freedom now to affect this world, the last judgment, even that will be gone, and the full intensity of the divine wrath will be poured upon them forever. This so much nobler creature, this greatest of all creatures, Lucifer, the most tormented of all. And here we, 
the Son of God takes our nature, being for, found in form as a man, he was obedient even unto death. Though the mere contemplation of death in Gethsemane made him sweat drops of blood. And even though on Calvary he had to cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of that for fallen human sinners by a God who had no mercy whatsoever on fallen angels. Number 10, as if God lived and moved and had his being in man. Man whose only greatness is his humility. He had much about which to be humble. He had nothing about which to be proud. He had nothing and less than nothing except God as Savior. And say it's very strange language. And you know it's, of course, not true. But on the other hand, you can't deny that God looks as if he lives for man. And that while we have our very being in God, it almost looks as if he has his raison d'etre, his very reason for being in order to redeem man. I repeat, there would have been no creation. There would have been no providence. There would have been no incarnation. There would have been no redemption. There would have been no history. There would have been nothing except God if it hadn't been for man. This whole thing was made for man. Elect man, chosen man, redeemed man, Man in Christ. If you could find a greater compliment to the existence of human nature than that, I'd like to know where you'd find it. As I say, it's almost as if God existed for man. The only reason he had being, who is only being, an everlasting being, is that he might create a bride for his son. And do you realize what that means? That in the eternal family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in their ever-blessed love for one another, and their utterly perfect happiness, the one desire they have is by the Son to have a bride. And because that son wants to have a bride, he plans to become a human being. God plans to create the angels and in time bring forth man, let him fall, and in the fullness of time have his son born of a woman, born under the law, to fulfill all righteousness for his own people, and to create a people whose peculiarity, as the book of Titus says, is their zeal for good works. To show that they have been redeemed by Christ and are in Christ, who is working in them to will and to do according to his good pleasure, so that they in time are actually conformed to his image and made to be like him who lived for them and died for them, and rose for them, and ascended for them, and intercedes for them, and later is going to come for them, these fallen sons of the dust. We sinners who trust in Jesus Christ realize that sinners that we are, hell deserving as we are in ourselves, a whole universe came into being for our redemption. That's something pertaining to man, his nature and his significance, for which we who have come into this inheritance will be eternally grateful. Shall we thank God? Oh, 
Heavenly Father, when we ponder these things, this knowledge is too much for us. We cannot attain to it. We would never believe it. If thou hadst not opened thy sacred mouth and told us, how could we of ourselves have fancied there would be anything for us but a waiting doom? Judgment such as we read has come inevitably upon angelic sinners. What could we expect? And if by some reason or another our existence were extinguished and we ceased to be, that would be the highest hope we could conceivably entertain. But that we learn in thy word that where sin abounded, grace did yet more abound, and that this is the story of the whole creation and providence, <coughs> and that the whole reason, the only ultimate reason for the existence of anything that thou hast made has been for our salvation, that even the angels were appointed as our ministering servants. We who deserve nothing, who are fit only for ruin, actually brought virtually into the Godhead. <coughs> oh, Lord, help us, we pray thee, to live for him who died for us. In his name, amen.